few seats over here. scattered over the mountains were gathered together and made one, so may it also be with your holy church. Build it up from every nation, country, town, and village, from every house, and make it one living church. To you, Christ our God, be glory, now and always, and to ages of ages. Amen. I know everybody recognized where that prayer came from. <laughs> the liturgical conference. Okay, I'm not going to give it away. All right. So welcome, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you all to Helena College, Holy Cross, Greek Orthodox School of Theology. And blessed is our God who has gathered us together this day. We are blessed that this important liturgical conference is being held on our campus. This conference is part of the 75th anniversary of Holy Cross. And for the visitors especially, I would like to begin by saying a little bit about our school. Holy Cross is a small school by some standards, but it is a small school with a great mission. The mission is to prepare future clergy and lay leaders to serve the Lord, the Church, and the society. Theological education is essential to the well-being of the Church. We expect our clergy and future lay leaders to be persons of faith, who appreciate the rich heritage of the Orthodox Christian faith, of learning, of culture, and of philanthropy. We also expect them to be caring persons, persons who are sensitive to the needs of God's people. We expect them to be thoughtful persons, persons who are aware of the realities of today's society. Today we have a remarkable student body in the School of Theology of 123 men and women. Our students come from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese and eight other Orthodox jurisdictions. Our students come from throughout North America and a number of other countries. Greece, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Australia, Bulgaria, Uganda, Armenia, and India. Holy Cross is not a very old school, but is a school that values 2,000 years of worship, <laughs> spiritual wisdom, mission, theological reflection, and philanthropy. We are, we are continuously reminded of the intimate relationship between worship and learning and virtue, of the beautiful, the good, and the true. 
Holy Cross is located here in the town of Brookline. Yet the influence of Holy Cross reaches far beyond this beautiful hill. Its graduates, its faculty, its publications have a significant influence upon the life of the church and the life of the world, not only in North America, but also in many other countries. The graduates of Holy Cross, both men and women, serve the church and the society throughout the United States, Canada, and about 20 other countries. Most of our graduates serve the church as clergy. Many others serve as theologians, counselors, religious educators, youth workers, iconographers, and monastics. The people of God are enriched by their service. Our conference has brought together an outstanding group of theologians. Each will address a particular topic. Many of them are graduates of Holy Cross. They have studied here under the wise tutelage of Father Archibiades Calibus, our former president and dean and emeritus professor of liturgy. I also ask you to join with me in calling to mind four important teachers and students of liturgy who have passed from this life. I have been especially blessed by their friendship, their witness, and their words. Father Alexander Schmemann reminded us of the centrality of the Eucharist and the fact that it is offered for the life of the world. Father Lawrence of New Skeet provided us with exquisite translations and expressions of restored liturgical services. Father Professor Father Ioannis Fundulis of Thessaloniki aided us in recovering ancient liturgical texts and offering rich commentaries on the liturgical life. Father Ioan Bria of Geneva called us to see the relationship between mission and liturgy and pointed us to the liturgy, the after the liturgy. <coughs> we have been blessed by, by their faith and by their wisdom. May the Lord our God remember them in his kingdom. I want to congratulate especially Father Philip Simaris, our assistant professor of liturgics, who is chiefly responsible for planning and organizing this significant gathering of theologians. Father Philip will now introduce our program. Because of our 75 year anniversary, we want to have an academic conference. And it is because of the vision of Father Tom that we decided to have a conference dealing with liturgy. And as you can see, that was a visionary idea because we'll look at the interest that this is fostered. And it is very natural because this is our bread and butter. This is uh, theology, lived out theology. And People sometimes get nervous when they hear something like liturgical renewal. But it turns out that when we're talking about liturgical renewal, we're really talking about renewing what we already have. We're not really talking about changing things. We're talking about recovering what we already have. Going back to the texts, going back to see the depth of what we actually have and recovering it. So I thank Father Tom for doing this. Another very opportune aspect that helped us decide to do this conference was the fact that Father Taft, Father Robert Taft, who is a renowned scholar, foremost scholar in liturgy, happens to be living very nearby in Weston. 
And as I read in one of his uh, interviews, uh, he said he wanted to be on the right side of the lake. So he just came from a very exhausting conference in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, and it seems that he doesn't want to go to these kinds of far away conferences, but since you're a neighbor here, I think we can do more of these kinds of things. Part of the philosophy of this conference was because of great names like Father Taft, Father Kalibas, <laughs> who have inspired us and have inspired the students who have gone to the school to have a love of liturgy and to look at these texts. texts uh, we wanted to bring some new names, people who are very zealous for liturgy and who have done a great job, people who have passed through the school and um, are fostering the progress of this science of liturgics. And also we want, I want to thank Father Kalibas because I see many old friends here, classmates, and Many generations, Father Kalibas has been teaching here more than 25 years, and all of them have been trained through Father Kalibas. And we love what we love liturgy because of Father Kalibas. And he also is the person who exposed us to people like Father Taft. And for this reason, I think it's most appropriate that Father Kalibas uh, introduce our keynote speaker. synonymous with excellence, with erudition, scholarship, with wit, faith, and devotion. <clears throat> Several months after my appointment to the faculty of Holy Cross, I attended a conference on liturgy that was held at Dumbarton Knox, Washington, D.C. It was May 1979. Among the presenters was Robert Taft. <coughs> I saw and heard there for the first time this man whose articles and essays and books I studied. I had expected to see an older man. Months before I had begun to read and study the first of his projected six-volume monumental scholarly work on the history of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the Great Entrance. <clears throat> Could a man so young, I thought, be an accomplished author, an author of a book of such exceptional thorough scholarship? <clears throat> it was much later that I learned that he and I were born 11 months apart in the same year. The comparison, however, Father Robert ends there. <laughs> I did not see Father Robert Taft or hear him again until 2009, when he delivered the Florovsky Lecture at the Otzo Meeting, the Orthodox Theological Society of America, held in this very room. More recently, I began to enjoy his company in a more private setting, at a dinner or a lunch, with one or two colleagues from Holy Cross. Always affable, warm, and down to earth, Father Taft proved to be an insightful commentator on a broad set of issues, a delightful interlocutor who impresses with his penetrating knowledge and analysis of things during these sessions. In the 30-year period between 1979 and 2009, 
I met Father Taft often, but never in person. I met him in the pages of his published essays and books, works that I devoured in order to enhance and deepen my knowledge of liturgy through the splendid riches of his scholarship, riches that I tried to pass on to my students for their enrichment. I became a student of Father Taft, having never attended any of his classes. <coughs> Through contact with his writings, several of our own graduates were inspired to pursue doctoral studies in liturgics. John Plentos, Stelios Muxuris, Stephanos Alexopoulos, John Chrysostom Nassis, and Father Philip Zamaris, whom I too congratulate for this wonderful symposium that he has organized. Father Taft was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and at the age of 17, he entered the Jesuit novitiate. He developed a passion for the Christian needs and was ordained a priest in the Byzantine Slavonic Rite in 1963. In 1998, he received the dignity of mitered Archimand Rite in recognition of his services to the Eastern Churches. In 1970, he received his doctorate from the Pontifical Oriental Institute. A prolific writer, the bibliography of his publications and writings comprises, if you can believe, 800 titles, written in English, French, and Italian, mostly published publications on Eastern liturgy, including 20 books. Father Taft is Professor Emeritus of Oriental Liturgy at the Pontifical Oriental Institute, where he served as Vice Victor, Vice Rector. He also served as Visiting Professor in the Graduate School of the University of Notre Dame, and is founder of the recently established Society of Oriental Liturgy. As a scholar, Father Taft is without equal Highly respected by his peers, he has received numerous academic awards, including three honorary degrees. As an educator, he is beloved by his students for his wisdom, openness, generosity, and readiness to help. As a priest, he is anxious, anxious to help people understand, love, and celebrate the mystery of the liturgy he has spent decades studying. A genuine human being, Father Taft is kind and considerate, a true Christian gentleman whose very person has been shaped by the prayer of the church. In one of his essays, Father Taft wrote, liturgy can be understood only by one who prays it. And in a note to one of his students, he wrote, I cannot imagine a more fitting, immensely rewarding ministry than to study the heritage of a people. And in the East, that heritage is conserved and transmitted through the liturgy in order to uncover its riches for the good of that same people and of all peoples to the unending glory of God. My brothers and sisters, it is my distinct honor, privilege, and joy to present to you the Right Reverend Roger McLeod, Robert Taft. professional colleagues and scholars in the liturgical sciences, sisters and brothers in Christ. I am honored by your invitation to address you on liturgical renewal and orthodoxy in this historic anniversary symposium. 
Let me begin by, first, first let me excuse myself for, uh, for speaking to you seated. I used to tell my students I've never in my life had a good teacher who taught sitting down. That remains true. However, when you're uh, what we call in Russian a study chok, an old Giza, heading down the other side of the hill without brakes, uh, I really am simply unable to stand, so you'll excuse me, I hope, for addressing you seated. Let me begin by specifying what I mean by some of the terminology I shall be employing in these remarks. I do so not with the pretense of predefining the parameters of what things are per se, or must be, but simply to indicate what I mean by Christian liturgy. What it is, whence it comes, what it is supposed to do, to whom it belongs, who, if anyone, has the right to modify or renew it, and where I stand on all such issues, regardless of what others might think. First of all, and obviously, I am using the term Christian liturgy in the modern English language sense of the that the Christian Church's official public worship, and not in the Greek or Slavonic sense, where liturgy means the Eucharistic liturgy, the divine liturgy. Second, liturgy in the Orthodox and Catholic traditions is not a descriptive, but a prescriptive reality. Not whatever Christians decide to do in church, but what they ought to be doing in church, according to the command and teachings of Christ, we believe to have been transmitted to us in the apostolic tradition. So liturgy is a given. <coughs> a tradition, not something someone's putative, though rarely demonstrated creativity, invents, but something we inherit and learn. Like a language or body of literature, it is a given reality one learns as part of a larger culture. English language and literature are not what we'd like or imagine them to be. They are what they are. And one finds that out not by daydreaming creatively about them, but by learning them. That does not mean that liturgy does not and cannot change. Liturgy is a cultural language, and like any language, it is always changing in small, barely detectable ways. But normally it changes like any other language via a complex evolutionary process that can be perceived only by long-term observation. It's kind of like watching the grass grow. To whom does this liturgy belong? First of all, it belongs to God because liturgy is his gift to us, not ours to him. I'm not the one who said, do this in memory of me. Jesus Christ did. But liturgy also belongs to us, since Christ gave it to us to celebrate for God's glory, which is at the same time our salvation. For God is glorified in us only in so far as we freely accept his gratuitous offer of salvation. So liturgy also belongs to the church, and we are the church. Not just the clergy, not, not just the bishops, but all of us. For the church means all the baptized communion of saints. Ikinonia ton aion. Above all, the liturgy is not the possession of the scholarly liturgical establishment, which is why I have always insisted that I am a liturgical informer, not a liturgical reformer. So what I believe the recognized experts of the academic liturgical establishment can best offer the church by the authority of their hard-earned knowledge is not a program of liturgical renewal, but rather the principles to guide our thinking on what that renewal should or should not mean and why. That is what I shall try to do this morning. Let me begin with what I make bold to call liturgical problems in contemporary orthodoxy. Liturgical problems in orthodoxy, some might protest. What do you mean? Everyone knows orthodox liturgical practice goes back to the time of the apostles and has remained unchanged ever since. Right? Well, not really. Well, the fact of the matter is that the list of serious liturgical problems in orthodoxy is a long one. So I shall confine them to a footnote and limit my discussion here to the Eucharist for reasons I'll explain later. But even with regard to the Eucharist, the widespread myth of changelessness is not the answer, it's the first problem. For not only has Orthodox liturgy, the Eucharist included, evolved naturally via the sort of slow, unprogrammed, spontaneous growth changes noted above, and as detailed in my 1993 booklet, The Byzantine Rite, A Short History. 
There have also been several planned and executed liturgical reforms in Orthodox liturgical history, ancient and modern, as Thomas Pott and others have shown us. Another pitfall to avoid in taking the liturgical problems is taking the liturgical problems of other churches as an excuse for doing nothing. <coughs> the prime example is the present liturgical disarray in the Roman Catholic Church, which some Orthodox would exploit as a warning against the dangers of liturgical change. The present Roman Catholic mess, and I am not referring to complaints about the New English translation, is a very special cultural problem, much of which has little or nothing to do with liturgy. Its remote origins go back to the refusal of upper-class French right-wing secular, even atheistic monarchists, supported by some Catholics and even Catholic bishops, to accept the French Republic, the modern world, and ultimately, as in the still unresolved ephemerist schism, the Second Vatican Council. The Orthodox would be ill-advised to meddle in that mess, seeking to exploit the right-wing Catholic return to a dead and gone 16th century Tridentine Catholicism as an example to be admired and imitated. That would be like Catholics exploiting the 17th century old believericism of Russian Orthodoxy provoked by liturgical change as some sort of model for today. Rather, if orthodoxy wants a Catholic model to follow, it is to be found in the hard-won Catholic victory over modernism to open the way to the ultimate acceptance of objective, modern, historical, critical thinking in viewing its own history. But while avoiding the all-too-easy pseudo-solutions in considering liturgical renewal, one must also avoid unilateralism. The Jesuit theologian Avery Cardinal Dulles showed in his 1974 classic, Models of the Church, that the church is not one, but many things, and can be viewed through different lenses, like a single ray of light refracted through a prism. The same is true of our church's liturgies, which reflect more than one model, even in the New Testament itself. One New Testament model would be the meals of Jesus with his disciples, like the Last Supper, and the meals of the risen Christ underlined in John 21, plus the Lady Eucharistic continuation as described by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. But there is also the totally different New Testament model of the heavenly worship of the Lamb in the Book of Revelation or Apocalypse of St. John, and in Jesus' heavenly liturgy expounded at length in the letter to the Hebrews, chapters 8 to 10. The post-Vatican II Roman Catholic Mass mirrors more the first New Testament model the Orthodox Divine Liturgy, the second. Which New Testament model is right? They both are, of course. But that does not mean one can be substituted or mixed with the other without destroying the model's symbolic integrity, a fundamental theme I shall return to in a moment. But before looking more closely at the Orthodox model of the liturgy, contemporary Orthodoxy is seeking to renew one must determine just what specific Orthodox liturgy or liturgies are to be renewed. For Orthodoxy has three Eucharistic services, each with its own text, nine canonical hours of the divine office, not counting the monastic misoria, the full panoply of sacramental mysteries, some of them with multiple services, like the ordination of deacons, presbyters, bishops, funerals and commemorative services for those who have reposed in the Lord, plus a plethora of occasional prayer services for every possible need. So what are we talking about? When one speaks of Orthodox liturgical renewal, one is usually talking first about what is called cathedral liturgy, the liturgy of the cathedral and parochial worshiping communities, as distinct from monastic liturgy. And within that context of local parish liturgy, one is usually focusing primarily on the divine liturgy of the Eucharist, and that I suspect for the following reasons. First, it is the church service Orthodox laity attend most frequently and are most familiar with, making it the one that poses the most problems and debates. Second, Orthodox tradition left the monastics free to control their prayer life according to the norms of their monastic typicon, of which there were many. Third, as everyone knows, in Orthodox parishes, practically no one celebrates the divine office fully according to the typicon, despite what they might be pretending to do. Everybody abbreviates. Whether they abbreviate rightly or wrongly is another question. So there are several redactions of the Tyricon followed even in the same church. 
Furthermore, parish abbreviations of these services seem usually made according to no rational norm by those with insufficient knowledge of the history of these services, their original structure and purpose. Even if the abbreviations did have such a rationale, most of the faithful are usually not present for the entire service anyway. And even those who are often pass, pass their time greeting friends, gabbing, lighting candles, venerating the icons, going to confession, doing almost anything but paying attention to the unfolding of the service. So I shall restrict my comments to the divine liturgy because I suspect that is what today's Orthodox really mean when they speak of renewing Orthodox liturgy. I say today's Orthodox because the problem is, of course, a new one. The Orthodox, like everyone else, do not live in a vacuum or on the moon. They live in today's largely westernized secular world where the question of liturgical renewal has been in the air since the 19th century. But it was not much of an issue before that because liturgical renewal, like everything else in creation, is a limited cultural phenomenon with a beginning and a history. The modern movement for liturgical renewal begins largely as a first world phenomenon because it was there that ordinary lay people first achieved a level of material well-being and education permitting them to indulge in the luxury of reflecting on what they did or did not like in their cultural ambience. Pre-modern illiterate peasants tilled their fields and did in church what they had always done and what they imagined they were supposed to do, without the ability or desire to question it. But then change was not desired. On the contrary, it was an unwelcome threat to the known ordering of things. So liturgical change is a new phenomenon fostered by the social elites who have the leisure and education to think about such things. But before one begins tinkering with a ritual tradition that is an integral, inseparable part of a people's age-old cultural heritage, one must first of all know what one is dealing with. And then one must proceed with the utmost respect and care. So what does the Orthodox Divine Liturgy represent? What model does it present to the attentive participant? For although all traditional Christian liturgies in the churches of apostolic tradition have the same purpose, they go about achieving it in different ways. Let us see first what liturgy is supposed to do and how the Orthodox liturgy does it. The purpose of Christian liturgy can be described in many ways, but they all come down to the same thing. According to the New Testament, what has replaced the Jewish cult of the old law is not a new set of rituals but the sacrificial self-offering of a person, Jesus Christ. And our true liturgy is this same sacrificial existence in us. In a word, the purpose of the Eucharist is not to change bread and wine into Christ, but to change you and me into Christ, a process Christ himself performs through the Holy Spirit, beginning with baptism, in which, according to St. Paul, we die to sin to rise to new life, his life, in him. Romans 6, 2 to 14, Colossians 2, 10 to 15, and so forth. So the purpose of liturgy is to recreate us into other Christs, so that it is we who through our lives in him become for a sin darkened world the cleansing waters of salvation, the word of forgiveness, the oil of healing. This is the teaching of the apostolic churches of East and West. Our liturgies are the source and model of life in Christ, that is why in the 13th century, the Latin Catholic Saint Gertrude would pray with devotio ipsius concordet cum officis ecclesiae, that her piety might be in agreement with the offices of the church. It is why the old ordination prayer of the Roman Rite instructs the ordinans, imitamine quod tractatis, imitate what you practice. The liturgy is the model of what you're supposed to be, not just what you're supposed to celebrate. In other words, imitate in your life the mysteries you celebrate in the liturgy. It is why St. Nicholas Cavastilas, the classic exponent of Byzantine liturgical theology during the Hesychus revival, writing around 1350, in his magisterial treatise on the life of Christ, a masterpiece of sacramental spirituality for any age, teaches that to be a Christian is to live in Christ, to be united to him. The sacramental mysteries are the means of initiation into this life and its nourishment and growth. 
Indeed, the mysteries are a metaphor in action, an analogy of life. Vokavasilas writes, I quote, What makes the bishop an exemplar of the altar is not only that he himself is a craftsman of the symbolic rites of the consecration of the altar, but that human nature alone of things visible is truly capable of being a temple of God and an altar, since it presents the image and type of that which is fashioned by men's hands. End of quote. But each liturgical culture we nowadays call a rite, the Roman rite, the Byzantine rite, the Armenian rite, accomplishes this in its own way, according to what retired Würzburg University professor Father Hans Joachim Schultz, one of the premier modern commentators on the Byzantine Orthodox liturgical theology, <coughs> calls its Symbolgestalt, or Shining's build, its symbolic form or epiphanic appearance. That is to say, how the concrete unfolding of the ritual celebration itself impacts on the participant observing it or participating in it. This is not just the frosting on the cake. It is an essential part of the rite itself and must be taken into account in any liturgical renewal or reform. Failure to do so would be tantamount to cultural suicide, destructive of the reality itself. In the case of the Roman rite, Less effusively symbolic than the Orthodox ritual, the danger is less perilous. The genius of the Roman Rite, to borrow the title of the famous and oft republished 1899 article by the erudite English liturgical scholar Edmund Bishop, is a noble simplicity that has proven easily adaptable to a variety of church architectures and liturgical dispositions, from Romanesque to Gothic, Baroque, Renaissance, 19th century Gothic revival modern and post-Vatican II renewal, without in any way distorting its genius. It even lends itself to a contemporary American folksiness. Good morning to all of you on this beautiful winter day. I hope you all had a good weekend and not too wearied by shoveling snow this morning. Let us now begin our Mass with the Pauline, Pauline salutation, the grace of our Lord, and so on and so forth. <laughs> now that folksy informality is not to everyone's taste. It can hardly be branded cultural suicide. But to do so is the opening of a Byzantine Orthodox divine liturgy being celebrated in a traditionally arranged and frescoed Orthodox church building would result in absurd banality. As Alexander Schmemann affirmed in his classic Vidini Vitovichskoya Boroslavia, Introduction to Liturgical Theology, I quote, the first principle of liturgical theology is that in explaining the liturgical tradition of the church, one must proceed not from abstract purely intellectual schemata cast randomly over the services, but from the services themselves. And this means, first of all, from their ordo. Taxis. That is precisely what the best of traditional orthodox mystagogy does. And it is remarkably like what Western Catholic theologians mean by the distinction between theologia prima and Theologia Segunda, which refers to the distinction between what former Catholic University theologian David Power called the symbolic and the theoretical faith expressions. In this understanding, Theologia Prima, or prime theology, would be the meaning rooted in the Church's traditional structures, as David Fagerberg of Notre Dame puts it, and not some theologians' ruminations on it. The Eucharist says, this is my body, this is my blood. That's Theologia Prima. What does that mean? How can that be possible? That's the theology of Segunda, in other words, attempting to understand what the faith reality is. So what Alexander Schwemann called the Byzantine synthesis is what we call today's Byzantine rite. <clears throat> and its orthodox theology of Prima is what Hans Joachim Schultz calls the Erscheinungsbild, or apparition of its symbolgestalt, or symbolic form, as it emerges in the celebration itself. As I developed at greater length in my Florovsky lecture in this room, which has already been referred to, the Byzantines saw their highly ritualized society in Neoplatonic terms. The imperial court and ecclesiastical institutions were seen as images or reflections of the celestial world. That is why the Byzantines were so preoccupied with ritual, even in secular matters. Earthly institutions, both ecclesiastical and temporal, were considered to mirror the order of the universe, a cosmic array created by God. This perceived link between heaven and earth had its religious basis in the mystery of the Incarnation. What had once been seen as an unbridgeable gulf between the divinity and humankind had been bridged by 
<clears throat> by the eternal word of God made flesh in the God-man Jesus. More importantly, for Econodou of Byzantine culture, not only did God himself become visible in Christ, so did salvation history. For the mystery theology of the Greek fathers rendered Neoplatonism active and open to sacramental portrayal. By taking Platonism's static vertical vision of the relation between the visible and invisible worlds, and by laying it on its side horizontally, rendered it dynamic by using it to interpret not abstract concepts, but the saving mysteries of salvation history. In this theology, the concrete real reality of church ritual constitutes both a representation and a re-presentation, a rendering present again of the earthly saving work of Christ. This vision, common also to the patristic West, was canonized for all time in the pithy summary of Pope St. Leo I, Leo the Great, who said, quod redemptoris nostri conspicuum fur in sacramenta transiva, that which was visible in our Redeemer has passed over into the liturgical mysteries of the Church. That sums up an entire patristic theology of liturgy. What Jesus did when he was walking around on earth, preaching and healing and forgiving and consoling, so he does through the liturgy of the church because what he did has passed over into the mysteries of the church. In other words, the reality is the same, its mode of presence to us is different. So in defending this Byzantine vision of reality, I'm doing precisely what George Filarovsky proposed in his plea that Orthodox theology return to the fathers. I have described in detail elsewhere and often the highly detailed and traditional Byzantine system of church architecture and iconography, determined by models approved by tradition and codified in normative regulations, and shall not detail all that again here. Suffice it to recall what the classic Byzantine liturgical theologians have affirmed of it, have affirmed of it from antiquity until today. Patriarch Saint Germanus I of Constantinople famously wrote, the church is heaven on earth where the God of heaven dwells and moves. This lapidary definition, endlessly repeated down through the ages, set the parameters of all future discussion on Byzantine worship and its setting. The legendary origins of Kievan Christianity confirm this vision. According to the so-called Chronicle of Nestor Nest for the year 987, the Bulgars, the Muslims, the Germans, the Latins, Jews and Greeks had all tried to pers persuade Prince Vladimir of Kiev to adopt their faith as the religion of Rus. So the prince sent out emissaries to examine what these faiths had to offer. And when the embassy returned home, they reported, the Greeks led us to the edifices where they worshiped their god, and we knew not whether we were on heaven or on earth, for on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty. And we are at a loss to know how to describe it. We only know that God dwells there among men." End quote. This orthodox worldview, based on the mystery of Christ's incarnation announced in the scriptures and explicitated in the texts of the liturgy and its classic commentators, has retained its force until today. I used to explain Schultz's Erscheinungsbild and Symbolgestalt concepts, his, his, this vision of the liturgy in its symbolic form, to my non-Orthodox students at Notre Dame, and then have them experience a liturgy, urging them just to let it wash over them without their noses buried in some translation, thereby surrendering to the inevitable Western temptation to reduce liturgy to words as if what the Orthodox tradition calls the Divine Liturgy were a lecture or a sermon. The impact was often remarkable, as in the witness of his students cited by Orthodox priest professor John Gillians. Let me cite some of his students that I'll just, just take one example. First, Christine, a Roman Catholic who had joined the Ukrainian Catholic parish, testified, and I quote, before my first Divine Liturgy, I had read that the rich beauty and symbolism of the icons, the candles, the incense, the bells, the vestments, even the rolls of the clergy, were all intended to create an image of and a real participation in the kingdom of heaven here and now. It sounded interesting, but perhaps theoretical. But when I walked into church that morning, that morning a bit late, I was struck first by what sounded like angels singing, and immediately inside the inner door, by movement, 
the movement of deacons and subdeacons in service, investments of pale gold and white, and they seemed to be nothing but angels. What I had read came flooding back because it did indeed seem that I had walked into an icon of heaven. It was unforgettable. End quote. So liturgies do indeed communicate a theologia prima via their symbol gestalt, in other words, their appearance. As Gerhard Delling has said, worship, I quote, is the self-portrayal of religion. In worship, the sources by which religion lives are made visible, its expectations and hopes are expressed, and the forces which sustain it are made known. In many respects, the essence of a religion is more directly intelligible in its worship than in statements of its basic principles, or even in descriptions of its sentiments." End quote. What had once been seen as an unbridgeable gulf between the divinity and humankind had for Christians been closed by the incarnation of the eternal Word of God made flesh. This not only bridged the gulf between divinity and humankind, it also made God's saving dispensation a permanently rea permanent reality portrayable in icon and ritual. As St. John Damascene, last of the Greek fathers, taught in his first apology against those who attacked the divine images, in former times, God who was out for without form or body could never be depicted. But now when God is seen in the flesh, I make an image of the God whom I see. That is profoundly orthodox. If you don't understand that, don't go to an orthodox church. Within this iconographic cocoon, the liturgical community commemorates the mystery of its redemption in union with the worship of the heavenly church, offering the mystery of Christ's covenant through the outstretched hands of his mother, all made <coughs> present and alive in the imagery of the iconographic scheme. <coughs> I'll skip some of this, otherwise we'll be here forever. But uh, uh, let me quote what St. Simeon of Thessalonica, last of the classic Byzantine liturgical commentators, Simeon died in 1429, uh, last of the classical Byzantine liturgical commentators met uh, by chapter 131 of his endless treatise, 131 chapters, good ones, his endless treatise on the Holy Temple, and I quote, the church is the house of God, is an image of the whole world, for God is everywhere and above everything. The sanctuary is a symbol of the higher and super heavenly spheres, where the throne of God and his dwelling place are said to be. It is this throne that the altar represents. The heavenly hierarchies are found in many places, but here they are accompanied by priests who take their place. The bishop represents Christ, the church represents this visible world. Outside it are the lower regions and the world of beings that live not according to reason and have no higher life, in other words, the animals. The sanctuary receives within itself the bishop who represents the God-man Jesus, whose almighty powers he shares. The other sacred ministers represent the apostles and especially the angels and archangels, each according to his order. I mention the apostles with the angels, bishops, and priests because there is only one church above and below since God came down and lived among us, doing that for which he was sent on our behalf. And it is a work which is one, as is our Lord's sacrifice, communion, and contemplation. And it is carried out both above and here below, but with this difference. Above it is done without any veils or symbols, but here it is accomplished through symbols, because we humans are burdened with the flesh that is subject to corruption." End quote. Worshipping in this atmosphere of profuse, profuse symbolism through which the supernatural splendor of the inaccessible divine majesty and holiness is approached, the worship has witnessed the exaltation and sanctification of creation. The majestic appearance of God who enters them, sanctifies them, divinizes them through the transfiguring light of his heavenly grace. It's not just a matter of receiving the sacraments but of living habitually within a liturgical ambience that encompasses one in body and soul, transfigured through faith into a concrete vision of spiritual beauty and joy. Peter Hammond captures something of this in his description of humble Greek village churches. I quote, Outwardly they are scarcely distinguishable from the cottages which surround them. Within, however, one finds oneself in another world, Walls unpierced by windows are covered with paintings which set forth the whole story of creation and redemption. Patriarchs and prophets mingle with the saints of the new dispensation. 
Elias is caught up to heaven in a chariot of fire, and Jonah goes down to the bottom of the mountains with the weeds wrapped around his head. Those whose names are on and throughout the length and breadth of Christendom, Athanasius, Basil, Gregory the Divine, rub shoulders with local saints, like St. George of Yanina and the Neomathas. The Lord Christ is baptized in Jordan. He changes the water into wine and reigns in triumph from the tree of Calvary. The Holy Spirit descends in tongues of fire upon the apostles. For the Greek Christian, the humblest, humblest village church is always heaven upon earth, the place where men and women, according to their capacity and desire, are caught up into the adoring worship of the redeemed cosmos, where dogmas are no barren abstractions, but hymns of exulting praise, and the saving acts of the divine compassion, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into the heavenly places, are made present and actual through the operation of the Holy Spirit, whoever was and is and shall be, having neither beginning nor ending, but forever joined to and numbered with the Father and the Son, through whom the Father is known and the Son glorified by all, acknowledged one power, one worship, and one order of the Holy Trinity." End quote. Does that mean this Byzantine vision cannot be changed? Not at all. The point I wish to make is that this symbol system exists, derived from classical Greek culture, remodeled as part of the age-old patristic tradition of the Orthodox Fathers, and therefore must be understood, respected, and taken into account by any Orthodox proposing change. In addition to the problem of symbolic form, there is the problem of the liturgical language, which in Orthodox circles is twofold. And failure to distinguish the two quite distinct issues can lead only to confusion. First of all, orthodox discussions on liturgical language are sometimes sidetracked by non-liturgical cultural issues that may have weighty historical cultural importance for the church in question, but have nothing whatever to do with the liturgical issue. One can fully understand and sympathize why it is difficult for the Greeks and Armenians, for example, to consider a band in Chrabah or the biblical and patristic Greek of the liturgy so fundamental to their cultural heritage. That issue needs to be addressed, but not by ignoring the simple fact that liturgy does not exist to preserve Greek or Armenian culture. Though it may indeed help to do that, it exists to save souls, and to do that better would help if those souls understood what was going on in the liturgical mysteries being celebrated. That and that alone is the only liturgical issue from a pastoral point of view. And it can be stated as follows. Is the liturgy celebrated in a language the worshipers speak and understand or not? And if not, wouldn't liturgy do its work of sanctification better if it were understood? That is the sole pastoral liturgical question we need to ask. But the perfect is the enemy of the good. And if a church wait, waits to celebrate the liturgy in the vernacular until it has produced a single text everyone agrees on, then they might as well give up the project, since that will never happen. <laughs> Discussion of the nature of liturgical language, problems of translation because of obscurities in the liturgical text, the need for liturgical catechism, this is all interesting, necessary, and true. Just as it was true of translations of the Bible or of Dante or whatever, but none of that has prevented excellent, if not perfect, only God is perfect in case you didn't know it, not perfect translations of the Bible from being made. So discussion and the search for perfection will not, cannot solve the basic liturgical problem of whose solution anyone knows that anything about liturgy is convinced. That is to say that the liturgy should be understood by those for whom its prayers are destined and that is not God, who knows it all already, but us. <laughs> so orthodoxy does not need to reinvent the wheel, since Anglicans and Roman Catholics and Protestants have all been through this already, some recently, some centuries ago, and have learned that the only solution is to produce the best text one can, and then use it. In the process, use will indicate where the translation needs to be improved. So guess what? One improves it. Before doing that, one must decide what vernacular language level is to be used. For like the issue of liturgical renewal, the very question of liturgy in the vernacular is a new one. The most developed countries of today's so-called first world provide a cultural ambience where universal education is a long-standing acquisition and linguistic unity is centuries old. 
where the language everyone speaks is basically the same, and where the gap between the spoken and written language is often narrow to minimal. But things were not that way in late antiquity, when even if the people did hear the homily and liturgical prayers, that in no way means that they fully understood them. Before the modern era, most of the Christian faithful were illiterate and unschooled, spoke and understood a dialectical <coughs> form of their native language, and had a limited vocabulary. The language used in the liturgy, even if a literary form of their mother tongue, was of a quite different level from the vernacular they spoke and employed, a vocabulary at least partly beyond their grasp. St. Gregory Nazianzen, who died around 390, briefly Bishop of Constantinople in 380 to 381, tells how he dreamt of the people shouting at him in church to preach to them in ordinary and understandable speech. So even if the liturgy were celebrated audibly in the literary form of their mother tongue, the ordinary people would not have understood everything that was said. Even today, multiple dialects more or less distinct from the official language are spoken in much of the world, and the gap between the literary language and the spoken vernacular is sometimes such that the uneducated would not fully grasp a literary sermon. <coughs> when I was teaching at Kuliat Baghdad, Baghdad College in the 1950s, the then Chaldean Patriarch of Babylon, the Beatitude Mar Yusuf the Seven Hanima, was a famed orator whose listeners stood in awe at his preaching in classical Arabic. But many of them, when asked, could not tell you just what he had said. An analogous situation existed in Greece until the overthrow of the military junta in 1976, when the Montiki, the language Greeks actually speak, officially replaced Katarevusa, the artificial, archaizing literary language of ecclesiastics and the educated elite. Sometimes the problem of liturgical intelligibility, problems of liturgical intelligibility are simply dismissed. Some years ago, the informative and reliable Service Orthodox de Presse, monthly newsletter of the French Orthodox jurisdiction within the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the same one that runs the Institut Orthodox Saint-Serge, where many of the greats of 20th century American Orthodoxy learned their theology, reported a statement of His Holiness Moscow Patriarch Alexei II that the Russian Orthodox Church did not need to translate the liturgy into the vernacular because all Russians understood Church Slavonic. <laughs> that is flatly false. There are indications of online further, de on online or further develops on this issue, which I won't go into. It is true that any Russian Orthodox knows the Our Father because they learn the Our Father in Slavonic. They don't learn it in Russian. They know what Gosvidi Bavili means. They know the, 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 some of the basic text. But do they understand? Do they understand a psalm or the reading of an epistle of Saint Paul? Absolutely not. So the problems are many, and endless debate and commissions will not solve them. So maybe one should just have the courage to use the best translations already available, like an excellent British translation by my dear friend Achimand Wright from Lash. It's an excellent translation of the liturgy from Greek into English. All of the above discussion is based on the presumption that the prayers are to be recited aloud, of course. I have demonstrated beyond cavil that this has been the ancient usage, at least for the anaphora. There's no question about the fact that the Eucharistic prayer was once recited aloud, period. The evidence is in. There is no further discussion needed on that problem. But which other prayers have been recited aloud? Surely not all of them. For some prayers added later to the Christian liturgical text are private devotional prayers of the clergy that surely should not be said in the hearing of the congregation. Whereas those prayers that mark the basic primitive liturgical units of the liturgy certainly should be. As I have explained in my writings, what I call a liturgical unit evolved in the three empty spaces of the primitive Eucharist, where originally there was an action without words, that later came to be covered by a psalmic chant and concluded with an oration. These three pristine units, liturgical units in the Byzantine Eucharistic liturgy, are the minor introit, or little entrance, the major introit, or great entrance, and the rites of Holy Communion. These three orations should certainly be said aloud, for they mark and explain the main points of the service. To end, if not conclude, for not everything can be about everything, there are innumerable issues I have not discussed, which prayers should be said aloud, 
which should definitely not be. What about the frequent parish celebrations of other holy mysteries and services like Christian initiation, marriages, funerals, the divine office, and so forth? Alas, as noted 20th century American author Gertrude Stein said at the end of a lecture she gave at Oxford on contemporary literature when some earnest young thing in the audience asked her, what about the woman's question? <coughs> As one recounting the story of the late Tony Jude, Jude uh, British historian and New York University professor noted, and noted public intellectual commented, Stein's reply should be emblazoned on every college notice board from Boston to Berkeley. Not everything can be about everything. That principle fundamental to any scholarly discourse is especially opposite here, not only for the reasons already cited, but especially because I refuse to be a reformer. So I can only remind you of the principles and problems involved in liturgical renewal, which is the decision not of the scholars, but of the churches of God. So I have given you another list of what should be done to renew Orthodox liturgy, of examples of the kind of thinking that must accompany any discussion of that problem. For renewal is the task of the church, for his thinking as that of the intellectual. Thank you for your attention. You see, when Westerners ask that question, basically what they're saying is, you know, why don't the Orthodox do the readings we have, you see? Um, why don't we turn it the other way around? Why don't we, to use the, in, in the Roman tradition, why don't the Roman tradition use the readings of the Orthodox? Said, why should they? Why should they? Other, other problems would be more easily solvable, for example, the problems of calendar, you know. 
Now, you want to know when Easter really is by a telescope, for God's sake. <laughs> system of uh, uh, Latin liturgical explanation, medieval liturgical explanation, matter and form. That goes back ultimately to, to, uh, to St. Augustine's statement that accedit uh, verbum uh, et fit sacramentum. The word comes and the sacrament is made or happens. In other words, there is there's bread and wine, there's water, there's, there's that and the other thing and so forth. And it's only the words, the prayers, that ultimately explain what it is. People used to, people often come in and say, what are you celebrating the liturgy for? And I said, read, read the book, it's all right there, you know. I didn't make it up, you know. We're celebrating the liturgy for the salvation of the world, that the, you know, obedient to what Jesus Christ told us to do. We're celebrating the liturgy for the hierarchy, for the sick, for the poor, for the needy, for the this, for the that. Just read the book. If you want to know what the liturgy is, just read the prayer. You see, the Eucharistic prayer tells us what the liturgy is about. That's why the people ought to hear it and understand it. That's where the theology of the liturgy is. We pray for the hierarchy. We pray for the dead. We pray for why? Because everybody is saved by the blood of Christ, including his mother. That's why in the earliest Byzantine prayers for Mary, they prayed for Mary in exactly the same words as they prayed for their grandmother. Because everybody is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? You see? You're never going to learn that kind of stuff unless you know what the prayer says. You know? That's why it's important. So to reduce the prayer just to the words of institution is to return to the worst in medieval Latin scholastic theology. How dumb can you be? <laughs> Forgive me for insisting, but do you see any connections between liturgical scholars as informers and reformers in as much as the decision makers in the church may not be philosopher kings? No, well, if, if there was some current going between their ears, you know, maybe they uh, maybe they would consult people who do know something. It's always possible. <laughs> plenty, of people, plenty of people out there who uh, who uh, uh, are you know, capable of giving them that assistance. Uh, but I have uh, never posed myself as a church group. It's not me to say what churches should be doing. I've got my own ideas as to, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, some things that could be improved in liturgy, and I've uh, certainly in my, my publications have shared many of those ideas, but, you know, I don't run the church. John Ball of it, yes. Perhaps you can use the example of Adai and Mari? Ah, uh, yes, well, that's the, <laughs> that's one of the great victories. Uh, yeah. Explain, yeah, I think that explains the answer to this question. The Eucharistic prayer of Agda and Mari is uh, probably one of the oldest uh, Eucharistic prayers in existence. Most scholars would think that the original text goes back to the third century. Uh, third century is pretty old. Um, and Agda and Mari doesn't have the words of institution which some people mistakenly refer to as the words of consecration. The whole prayer is the prayer of consecration. It's not magic form. Uh, 
it doesn't have them in direct discourse, in other words, as if the priest were saying them in, in persona Christi, as they say in the person of Christ, this is my body, this is my body. It talks around it, in other words, it refers to the Last Supper, it refers to the institution of the Eucharist by Jesus, but it doesn't have those words which, according to Catholic, often uh, Catholic theology, as it's often portrayed, uh, it wouldn't be a valid Eucharist. You know, where's the consecration? The words of consecration. I've got an article coming out in the next issue of St. Bolivia's Quarterly, and I put it there because I especially want Orthodox to read it, where I propose an ecumenical solution, that is to say a Pacific solution, to the problem of different consecutory theologies between the Latin West and the Orthodox East. What did the Vatican do? The Vatican was kind of over a barrel because they were in a dialogue with the uh, Assyrian Church of the East, as they call themselves, uh, and this is their main Eucharistic prayer. You know, so I mean, how can how could they not uh, accept the validity of the Eucharist of this ancient church? Uh, whose prayer goes back to the third century. But then what are you going to do with this theology of the words of consecration if they don't have them there, see? Well, the Vatican sent this text, uh, sent, uh, sent this problem out to about, uh, I, don't know, I think they told me that there were 24 of us that they, uh, they sent it to. And, uh, you know, I strongly argued for the validity of the text, uh, saying in the first place, how, how are you going to tell a church that's as old as this that they never had the Eucharist? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I mean, what arrogance would that be? Uh, well, how could we do that? Well, I, I argued, for you know, I'm a boy with the argumentation. And we won. The Vatican approved it. It went to the Pope. The Pope approved it. Uh, so, I consider that one of my great life victories, uh, you know, this, uh, why? Because this just blew out of the water, it didn't, didn't just approve the Eucharist of this ancient church, but it blew out of the water this formulaic view of the Eucharist that, you know, these are the words and whammo, you know, it happens. <laughs> This really just blew open, uh, blew open liturgical theology from, at least from the Catholic point of view. Uh, I don't know if that takes care of Father. Let's make Father Walderman here, Father Walderman. Yes, I want well, to uh, thank Father John Walderman for being present here. Uh, I, he never would have forgiven me if I didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> right about that. <laughs> you want me a martini? <laughs> Bombay Sapphire Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> Having mentioned the Pope, let us also congratulate our Roman Catholic brethren on the uh, new Pope, Pope Francis, who happens to be a Jesuit, as Father Robert is, and Father John. And we pray that the Lord grants him wisdom and will be uh, the pastor of the church in these holy times. Other question. Well, you said you had your say. <laughs> You're first to say someone else. Uh, yeah, I was reading uh, Father Alexander Schmemann's journals uh, this past summer, and I was struck by the fact that uh, with all the writings that I read officially on liturgy that were so so refreshing, so revolutionary, we made, a, we made reference to this explicitly in the article in St. Vladimir's uh, quarterly four years ago that was probably from the, this conference. But what, what I was not aware of was his very candid um, exasperation sometimes in the imperial accretions of a context for liturgy as a whole. He's reflecting primarily on the uh, Slavic tradition uh, coming through Russia in which the going on and on and on and the expansion of things that 
fit in a context at one point, but was no longer a lived context within the life of the church. And it, it sort of drove home to me the critical difference of contextualization of these rich symbolic forms of the East that exploded in imperial, not just the cathedral monastic forms, but the imperial elaborations that we are still living with, that we're now challenged to deal with in a post-imperial context, in which we no longer have the imperial uh, forms of state and society that we're working with. So I just want to get some feedback from you, because really I was struck by that. It, uh, how, as much as Schmemann was a voice there, I was not aware of these private, very candid comments sometimes, or just exasperation of some of his experiences yeah. within worship. Yeah, in the first place, Schmemann overdoes the imperial business. Uh, Schmemann was a, was a great man, but he certainly wasn't uh, a great scholar from the historical point of view. Uh, sure. Yeah, he was, uh, he was a, much more of a theologian, a pastoral uh, man, and, uh, uh, and a good friend, I must say. Uh, know him very well. Uh, but <clears throat> everything occasionally needs to be cleaned up, you know. Uh, more is not always better. Uh, and so uh, that's something that uh, should always be a pastoral concern. <coughs> it's just, you know, it's like uh, it's like Offros, you know. You know, Offros is done by you know uh, a couple of old men in double-breasted suits, you know. And uh, who else is there? Nobody. Uh, uh, well, what's the point of it? Uh, at least we need to think about these things, you know. Uh, but I think that that's why I was emphasizing the. The symbol of Gestalt, the symbolic form of the liturgy. This um, doesn't mean that that can never change. It doesn't mean the liturgy can't be uh, cleaned up a little bit. You know, there's, uh, there's been an awful lot of uh, material added to the liturgy in the course of its, uh, of its development. Uh, you know, now and then you can also cut the grass, you know, not just let it grow. Um, so, uh, but that is done by the church. It's not done by the scholars. The scholars can assist the church through uh, explaining how things got the way they are, what are the essential elements of a particular liturgical service, uh, whether people are adequately understanding what they're doing in the liturgy. Father well, Baldwin recently published a very uh, interesting article as to whether the liturgy was really kind of, you know, hitting its, uh, its aim, whether it was achieving what it was supposed to do and showing that uh, from the behavior of people sometimes, it's obvious that they really don't know what's going on. Uh, that's unfortunate. So, uh, you know, occasionally things need, do need to be considered. But that's the work of the church, not the work of the scholar. The scholar can inform, but not inform. At least that's my view. I don't think people should play around with the liturgy by themselves the way some priests do. Who do they think they are? They're being creative. I've never understood why people who never manifested the slightest creativity in any aspect of their human existence <laughs> think that they're Beethoven, you know, and, and, uh, you know, when it comes to the liturgy. Give me a break.
spoke about the strengths of each. Um, but you also identified them uh, partly as cultural expressions, and cultural expressions have an expiry date. I mean, they have a certain shelf life, and or they or they change gradually over time. What what does that and that, what does that kind of um, assessment of varying liturgical expressions uh, imply for an instance uh, such as uh, the current uh, Orthodox situation in the United States, where you have a very dramatic or rapid cultural shift that's happening in certain spheres of the church's life, um, and yet there are other spheres in which there's a slower, much more gradual adaptation. Um, certain things are, there's a, uh, well, there's just a variety of different forces that are either accelerating or reducing the rate of that change. What, what does that imply for, for the way in which the liturgy should organically um, change or evolve? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. You see, the, the liturgy, you know, we use, we use the term culture. I mean, uh, but let's, let's take Russian culture. I mean, what is Russian culture? Russian culture is Russian orthodoxy, period. If you don't know that, you need a lobotomy. <laughs> the communists tried to wipe that out. Did they succeed? No. They went down the drain, you know, with the rest of the sewer of that, that terrible period of persecution. But does that mean that it can't change? No, of course not. I mean, uh, culture always develops. But as I said, it's sort of like watching the grass grow. You know, unless you take it over a very broad period of time, uh, then you don't notice it. And furthermore, we have entered, as I said, into a new period of uh, historical critical thought where we simply don't accept, you know, everything that comes down the pipe. Uh, we have the ability to study reality and to pass critical judgment on it. But that's new. That's new. We are in a new historical epoch, therefore, with respect to intellectual life, which is really the result of overcoming the modernist crisis in Western Christianity, whereby there was an attempt to, to evacuate or, or, or destroy the true basis of Christianity, turning it into a kind of mythology. And it took a long time to overcome that crisis, and that crisis was overcome by eventually condemning the modernists from a theological point of view, but also by you know, dragging the church, speaking of the Catholic church now, kicking and screaming into the uh, 20th century. There was a time during the modernist crisis when the Catholic Church condemned everything from democracy to the railroad. <laughs> I kid you not, I'm not making that up. Why? Why the railroad? Well, why? Because the railroad was unnatural. You were supposed to be riding behind a horse, you see. That was natural. It was, you know, dumping on, my, on the path as he was going along. <laughs> but the railroad didn't do that, so the railroad was to be condemned. We finally got through that, and we got through it by accepting a modern historical critical view of reality. In other words, where people are able to really take a critical view of their own reality. Does that mean we don't live by a myths? No, everybody lives by their myths, you see. A myth <coughs> is not a falsehood. A myth is the image we have created of what we are. Um, you find that we just had the Catholics just elected a new pope, you know, the papacy. The papacy as the, the success of the vicar, they call the pope the vicar of Christ. The pope used to be called the vicar of Peter. Not the vicar of Christ, you see. But as things go on and develop, the myth, in other words, what people see as the image of what they are, it increases, and sometimes it needs to be kind of cut down. 
Uh, that's what historical critical thinking will do. There have been excellent histories of the development of the papacy. And if the papacy could develop one way, that means it could, to a certain extent, undevelop. Wow, that's a modern conclusion. Now, nobody could think like that you know, a couple of centuries ago. It just wasn't part of, of the Christian approach to reality. Well, it is now. Just read the, read the history of the development of the papacy by fully loyal Catholic study by the Jesuit scholar named Schatz. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. Wonderful demythologizing book. It's not out to destroy the papacy. It's out to explain how it really developed. Wow. Yeah. That's the modern world. Can you really take a look at yourself honestly? If you can't, you're still living in the 19th century, maybe the 18th century. That's the modern world we live in. That's the work of a scholar. Anyway. We thank Father Robert very much.